You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. It may sound dull, maybe even monotonous, but this is what miracles sound like. This is the sound of a child surgery being performed by a robot. Our personalized care leads to miraculous things. Like innovative procedures with less pain and faster recovery. Children's Hospital Colorado. Here, it's different. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 116, the September Campaign Part 8, Danzig and Army Group, Maudlin. This week, a big thank you goes out to Michael and Keith for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. You can find out more about becoming a member over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. During this episode, we're going to be discussing the events of the first roughly five days of the German invasion of Poland in two important sectors. The first will be the areas around and inside of Danzig, the free city on the Baltic Sea, adjacent to both the Polish Corridor and East Prussia. The city and the areas around it were also completely indefensible within the grand scheme of how the Polish military leaders believed a German invasion would develop. It was almost inevitable that any forces placed in and around Danzig would be cut off from assistance by a German attack across the central or southern areas of the Polish Corridor. The other area that we will focus on today will be the area of the border defended by Army Group Modlin, which was positioned between the southern border of East Prussia and the Polish capital of Warsaw. This was one of the most important areas for Polish defense because it was only about 100 kilometers between the border and the capital. It would be in this region that the Polish military had the least margin of error due to the general importance of Warsaw to the general functioning of the Polish military effort. Just as in every area of the fighting in Poland, during the first few days of the invasion, in both of these areas there was a mix of surprisingly stout Polish defense and almost completely unopposed German advances. We start with what is almost certainly the most hopeless situation for the Polish military, Danzig and the Baltic Sea Coast. As we discussed back in episode 111, the general belief among Polish military and political leaders was that attempting to defend the Polish corridor, and especially the areas furthest to the north, was a complete lost cause. With all of the other areas that had to be defended, and which were more important to national defense, there was just no way that the Polish army could put enough troops in the corridor to mount a serious defense. At its widest, the corridor was only about 100 kilometers from the western German border to the eastern German border. But there were political challenges to just ceding the corridor that would basically always going to be cut off by a German advance. With the general concern being that if Poland did not defend the area, Germany might just invade, occupy it, and then sue for peace without really engaging with the Polish military in a meaningful way. With the necessity of defending the Polish corridor established, two Polish military formations would be created, the Pomorsza Army stationed to the south and the Land Coastal Command guarding the northern areas of the corridor and the Baltic Sea coast. The Pomorsza Army will be the topic for our next episode, and today we will focus primarily on the forces that were grouped under the Land Coastal Command. Within that land coastal command were around 14,000 men, most of which had only arrived in their units in the days before September 1st. The five battalions of reservists would augment the two naval infantry battalions that were already in the area to form two naval rifle regiments. The two regiments were not well equipped with heavy weapons, with a distinct lack of artillery when compared to other Polish army units further south. This fact ties back to the the idea that while these troops were going to defend the coast as long as possible, there was very little hope of their survival. 
The nearest Polish forces were as much as 50 kilometers to the south, and it was expected that the vastly superior German force would make Danzig one of the very first targets in the upcoming conflict. On the German side, the focus of their plans was strictly on capturing Danzig and establishing a secure land link across the Polish corridor. If Polish defenders remained on the coast, they were of little concern, and the stretch of coastline that they occupied had no real strategic value. Because of this, the forces designated to capture Gdynia and the coastal areas was not the best equipped or trained and was clearly a second-tier German formation under the command of Lieutenant General Leonard Kapisch. Near Danzig, one of the most important areas was the military depot that had been built at Westerplatte. They had put some work into fortifying the area to make it more defensible, and unlike some other areas in Danzig, it was also an area where Poland had been given full control, which allowed them to establish and provision the military depot. Interestingly, they had been given this control due to the importance of Westerplatte as an area where military goods were offloaded from abroad and then transported into Poland. After 1938, the Poles had put even greater effort into reinforcing their position and treating it like a Polish bastion in the city. There were 210 soldiers within the fortifications, which by the start of the war consisted of barbed wire entanglements, seven bunkers, trenches, and earthworks. They were also provided with four mortars, one field gun, and two anti-tank guns, so, so they had a, a good amount of defenses. The geography of the area also favored them, with the Polish depot at the end of a peninsula which was as narrow as 250 meters. The primary fortifications were also in a wooded area, which gave them some more cover from German observation and attack. On August 31st, the commander of the garrison would be informed that there would be no further reinforcements given to him, and he could expect no further assistance once a German attack started. It was well known to the Germans that this would be an important position that they would probably need to assault in the opening hours of the attack if they wanted to fully control Danzig, and so they would plan to provide fire support for a ground attack with the pre-dreadnought battleship, the Schleswig Holstein. The Schleswig Holstein was an old ship, launched in 1906 as one of the last pre-dreadnoughts built for the Imperial German Navy during that period. The ship had originally been decommissioned in 1917 before being turned into a floating barracks. It was partially due to its decommissioned status that it was allowed to survive the post-war peace settlements that saw the rest of the German Navy surrender to the British. By 1918, it was felt that an old prey dreadnought like the Schleswig Holstein was not really a threat to any of the other navies around Europe, so the Germans got to keep it. But at 4.47 a.m. on September 1st, the ship, and most importantly its guns, were certainly a threat to the defenders at the Westerplatte. Over the course of seven minutes, the ship would fire eight 28cm or 11-inch shells and 39 15cm or 6-inch shells at the defenders. More stakes were made, though, and because the ship was so close to the target, at around 500 meters, some of the shells did not even arm in time to explode, and those that did explode at the proper moment did not really do much damage. In fact, in the entire seven-minute barrage, the total number of Polish casualties was zero. I am sure the bombardment looked really impressive to everybody who was able to watch, and the first ground assault would begin after naval infantry were landed and they would begin moving forward at roughly 5 a.m., one of the Polish defenders would later write that, quote, I saw how the Germans advanced. They had white canvas rucksacks, two long handle hand grenades each, and egg grenades in a bag, also of white canvas. They made very good targets, with their dark uniforms and white canvas bags, very easy to see from a distance. But we didn't have to strain our eyes, because we let them come as close as 30 to 40 meters before we opened fire. Few of them came out alive, end quote. The German marines never really had a chance in this early attack. The Polish resistance was far stronger than was anticipated, and when they moved forward past the outer depot wall, they came under heavy fire from multiple different angles. The initial assault was a failure, with pretty heavy German casualties along with a few Polish casualties, but, but not very many. This was not the last time that German troops would make the mistake of believing that they were moving in to mop up whatever remained of Polish resistance, only to be very quickly shown that the Polish defenses were largely unaffected by the pre-assault bombardment. After this first failure, the German ground commander requested a much more powerful bombardment of the Polish positions. The Schleswig Holstein would then go on to fire 90 28cm shells and 47 15cm shells over the course of about 75 minutes before a second attack went forward just before 9am. 
but the result was largely the same. The Polish defenses were not destroyed by the bombardment, and the defenders were more than ready to meet the German attack, resulting in another German retreat. Over the course of the two assaults, the Germans would suffer 136 casualties, balanced against roughly two Polish defenders killed. The second critical area of Danzig that would receive a large amount of German focus during the opening hours of the attack was the Danzig Post Office. The post office building in Danzig had been granted to Poland as a fully sovereign piece of territory, and this removed the limitations placed on that were placed on other areas of Danzig around what the Polish could or could not place sort of in the post office. Most importantly, this allowed them to make military preparations before the war. During the summer of 1939, a few changes had been made, and the men that were stationed in the post office were replaced by Polish reservists and members of the Polish militia. A Polish combat engineer was also dispatched to the post office to work on covertly bolstering its defensive capabilities. The post office occupied the eastern wing of a four-story L-shaped building, which made it a solid defensive position to begin with. The major alteration that was made was to start to brick up the interior passageways that linked the post office and its wing of the building to the Danzig Labor Office, which occupied the other part of the building. The Germans who planned to assault the building were about 150 men under the command of the senior Danzig police officer, with the unit built up primarily of Danzig police and the Danzig-based Heimwehr SS. Much like during the opening attack at Westerplatte, here again, the German attackers drastically underestimated the capabilities of the Polish defenders, and even though they were able to breach the brick walls that had been built inside the building, they immediately came under concentrated small arms fire that prevented them from moving any further. There was also an attempt to attack the building from the outside, an effort that was similarly repulsed. Undeterred from their ultimate purpose, the request was placed with the local SS commander, Johann Schaefer, to send some assistance. Schaefer's men had spent the morning moving around Danzig, taking control of buildings and the train stations and other areas, largely without facing any resistance from the Poles. He now shifted his focus to providing assistance to the assault on the post office. But instead of launching more direct assaults, Schaefer opted for a slightly more patient strategy. Artillery was brought in with two 75 centimeter and one 105 centimeter artillery pieces being available and placed to bring fire on the front entrance of the building. The 75 centimeter guns would prove to be largely ineffective against the strong brick walls of the building, and at 5 p.m. the Polish defenders were given the option of surrendering after several shots had been fired. When this was refused, the second part of Schaefer's plan was put into action. Because along with bringing in artillery, Schaefer also ordered the Pioneer unit to begin digging and tunneling under and towards the building's foundation. And at 5 p.m., they detonated around 600 kilograms of explosives near the front entrance, which created a hole in the wall. As soon as the hole opened, the 10.5 centimeter gun began firing directly through the hole and into the interior of the building and was immediately followed by another assault. This finally forced the Polish defenders to retreat to the basement of the building. When it was clear that they still would not surrender, the decision was made to bring a fuel tanker up to the building and they began to pump gasoline into the basement, which was then ignited by a hand grenade. One of the Polish survivors of this inferno would later recall, quote, everything went up in flames and we are in the cellar where we're suffocating with the gases. We decided because of the overwhelming German advantage to give ourselves up. When we cried out that we surrender, the Germans ignored us and continued the attack, end quote. Eleven of the defenders would be killed by the flames or by the burns that they suffered, with the rest surrendering by 7 p.m., this left 44 defenders having surrendered to the Germans, but just a month later almost all of them would be executed by firing squad after being tried under a military court as irregulars. Along with the efforts of the Polish forces to defend the city of Danzig and its surroundings, in the nearby city of Gdynia, the remainder of the Polish navy was also put into action. There was not a lot of naval strength to work with, but what was still in Gdynia would do what it could. The mine layer Griff attempted to fulfill its goal of laying mines near the Hell Peninsula, but as soon as it set sail, it was attacked by German aircraft and the plan was aborted. 
The other major operation was for the five available submarines to begin offensive actions against German ships near the Hell Peninsula, particularly aimed at preventing any kind of German amphibious landing. The submarines gave it a good try, but after the operation began on September 2nd, they would only be able to launch three torpedoes with no successful connections. Due to the danger of being a submarine close to the coast, on September 6th, the submarines abandoned their positions and moved further north and into the deeper areas of the Baltic so that they would be less detectable and vulnerable. They would continue their patrol for the next several days, but after 11 days, they began to run low on supplies. One submarine would make its way to Britain, with four others being interned in Sweden and Lithuania. The sum total of Polish naval operations during this period was, you know, a disappointing result, but they were so massively outnumbered that a little more could realistically have been expected. Outside of their operations against Westerplatte and the post office, over the course of September 1st, the Germans would fan out around the city and take full control, with 3,000 civilians arrested and sent to detention camps. Back at Westerplatte, September 2nd would begin with the Polish defenders still holding off any German efforts to attack the depot. On the second day of the assault, the Luftwaffe would take its turn at bombarding the Polish defenses with over 50 Stukas given the task, resulting in 26 tons of bombs being dropped on the area. This represented a very large concentration because the area being bombed was quite small. Following this effort by the Luftwaffe, the German infantry would wait a little bit to attack. I'm not, I'm not sure why they did this, but we do know that they did not immediately follow up the air attack with another ground effort. Instead, they would wait, not hours, but several days before really taking another crack at the defenses. It would not be until the early morning of September 7th that the final assault would begin. The days between September 2nd and the 7th would be spent softening up the defenses through the use of 105 centimeter and 21 centimeter howitzers before the Schleswig-Holstein was called in once again on the 7th. In the final assault at 5 a.m., the effort put forth by the attackers was very different than the early attacks on September 1st, including the uses of flamethrowers to neutralize the Polish defenses. The final surrender would occur on September 7th at 11 a.m., after the Poles had suffered 68 casualties and inflicted 200 on the German attackers. To the south of Danzig, the final act of the defense of the city had already been completed, when the units had been forced to retreat. The forces had been placed along the path between the city and the army Pomorsia to the south, which was positioned on the southern end of the Polish corridor. Eventually, German ground troops would arrive, and the Polish forces would be forced to either surrender or retreat. As would frequently happen during the defense of Poland, this meant that some Polish soldiers, the reservists who lived in the area, were forced to leave their homes and their families behind, in areas that would inevitably be captured and occupied by the Germans. Here is the account of Lieutenant Stodolsky discussing this moment that he experienced. Quote, After a few minutes, the company commander, Lieutenant Perkowski, and his platoon joined mine. The enemy was following right behind him and soon opened fire. I ran to the company commander and said, Captain, let's make a counterattack. But he responded, There is no time to fight. The path of retreat is closing in front of us. Send two machine guns to the hill, which are to stop the enemy. The rest will retreat. As my platoon retreated, I said goodbye to my wife and three children, standing in front of a hut. Great pain pierced my heart. I clenched my teeth so that I would not break into tears, squeezed my revolver, and marched there with the platoon where he had ordered me. End quote. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. 
I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode where I'd like to tell you a story. We now shift our focus to the area south of East Prussia, to the German attack that was planning to move south out of Prussia and towards Warsaw. This area was guarded by Army Maudlin, which had two infantry divisions and two cavalry brigades. This force was not designed or assigned the task of stopping the German advance at the border. The assumption was that the Germans would muster enough forces to force Army Maudlin to retreat, and when it did so, the goal was for the army to maintain as much of its strength as possible in a retreat to the Maudlin Fortress, which was northwest of Warsaw. This was also at where the Narev and Vistula rivers came together north of Warsaw, and so it was a reasonably important position. The hope was that Army Maudlin would be able to delay the German advance, providing additional time for forces in and around the capital to mobilize and prepare to defend the city. Arranged against Army Maudlin was the German Third Army, which planned to break through any resistance placed in front of them and then quickly advance all the way to the Vistula, with the hope being that the advance could be made in one single day, which would have meant an advance of 100 kilometers, which was very optimistic. They did know that there were some prepared Polish defenses that they would have to overcome, but they did not fully understand the extent of Polish preparations. One of the Polish infantry divisions had spent six weeks before the start of the war building defensive works, and they were aided by the geography of the region, with a portion of the front being swampy enough to make armored operations very challenging. The most important area was around the village of Mawawa, which was just 10 kilometers from the border. In this area, there were earthworks, 49 concrete bunkers, barbed wire entanglements, anti-tank ditches, and other anti-vehicle barriers. And that was just the first line of defenses, with another line further from the border that had more bunkers and more prepared positions. With both lines of defenses combined, there were over 30 kilometers of territory covered, which the Germans would have to find a way either through or around if they wanted to continue to make their way south. Recognizing these two options, the two Polish cavalry brigades were placed on each flank to help prevent that possible end around or flank attack from happening, while the infantry divisions took their positions in the defenses. When the German troops crossed the border, Army Maudlin was quickly alerted, and this allowed the troops to prepare themselves before the Germans arrived. The result was that when the men of the 11th Infantry Division and Panzer Division Kampf uh, arrived and encountered the Polish positions, they were stopped pretty quickly. Attempts were made to push forward and to capture certain villages, with the SS Regiment Deutschland, for example, trying to take the village of Uzniki Zadwaski, but they were unsuccessful. While the German infantry were attempting to push south towards Moava, Panzer Regiment 7 was waiting to exploit the expected breakthrough, but when that breakthrough did not materialize, the Panzer Regiment was also sent forward, but it quickly encountered some problems. One problem was the Polish defenses, a six-meter-wide anti-tank ditch that the German tanks could not move through, and so the decision was made to drive along the ditch to try and find a way around the obstacle. This gave Polish anti-tank gunners the perfect opportunity to use their 37mm anti-tank guns against the German tanks, damaging 32 of them. Eventually, the attack would be called off, and Kempf, the commander and namesake of Panzer Division Kempf, would report to 3rd Army Headquarters that the attack was a disaster, there were terrible losses of Panzers, number unknown, and an attack here is hopeless. With the challenge of attacking Moava directly seeming to be insurmountable, the decision was made for the primary focus of the German effort to be attacks to the east in an attempt to outflank the strongest core of Polish defenses. On the first day of the attack, the German 1st Infantry Division had attempted to make progress in this area, but to little success. But then on the second day, the situation in the area would be also kind of the same. This was true for several German divisions. Both the 11th and the 61st would attack and not really gain very much, but 
On the far left side of the German line, the 12th Infantry Division would have a little bit more success, and they would face the Cavalry Brigade guarding the Polish right flank to withdraw 5 kilometers. As the German attacks developed on the Polish side, they would also choose to withdraw the 79th Infantry Regiment to positions closer to Mawawa to prevent the line from being outflanked. So this was another Polish unit on their right flank retreating to, to a different position. Even though most of the attacks on the second day were unsuccessful, this little bit of progress on the German left would cause General Kukler, the 3rd Army commander, to order Panzer Division Kempf to reposition itself to the east to be ready for an attack on September 3rd. The division would spend most of the night moving the 45 kilometers to the east, and it would not be ready to actually attack until the middle of the afternoon on the 3rd. However, once the attack rolled forward, they were able to make some real progress for the first time, with several key villages to the east of Mawawa being in German hands by 4 p.m. This caused a kind of chain reaction along the Polish lines, as units were forced to retreat further west and south, jeopardizing the entire Polish line around Mawawa. Eventually, the order had to be given for the defenses that had been held by the Polish 20th Infantry north of Mawawa to be abandoned out of fear that they would be surrounded. One of the challenges that the Polish units would always have during this first week of the war is that when they were forced out of their prepared positions and forced to retreat, they almost instantly and consistently came under air attack. Brigadier General Anders of the cavalry brigade that had been watching the Polish left flank uh, would move through Mawawa during this time period after the 20th Infantry Division had been forced to abandon its positions. And he would say, quote, when I came up with it, the retreat had ceased to be orderly. Hundreds of German aircraft bombed the retiring columns and even made attacks on soldiers moving in small groups across the country. End quote. And here's an account from another Polish major. Quote, the bombing lasted about an hour and it was so intense that the sky was clouded with smoke and the bright autumn sun was no longer visible. When the squadrons flew away, the bombing was over and the smoke dispersed. A blood-chilling sight appeared in front of us. Bodies were strewn across the road and the horses that were killed were still in harness. The remnants of equipment and wagons were scattered around us. The trenches were full of slain soldiers. Those that survived emerged, but there were so few of them that in reality, the 34th and 50th Infantry Regiments had ceased to exist. End quote. While the Polish retreat was being attacked from the air as it moved south, instead of focusing their efforts on surrounding and neutralizing the retreating Poles, the orders were sent straight from the top, General Bach, the commander of Army Group North, to instead focus on the capture of Rosen, a town on the Narav River northeast of Warsaw, with the ultimate goal being of pushing even further to the city of Lamsa near the Bug River. But before the Germans could reach such lofty objectives, they first had to capture the city of Rosen. And that would prove to be quite difficult. The town was defended by over 3,000 troops, largely Polish reservists, and a battalion of 75mm guns. Panzer Division Kampf would be added to the German troops in the area, and they would launch a three-sided attack near midday, but with little success. The German infantry were unable to make much headway, and the Germans would lose about 10 tanks to Polish anti-tank and artillery fire. There was an attempt to outflank the defenses once again, but in these efforts the Germans had to contend with the Narav River, which was kind of difficult to cross. Some units would be sent across the river in rubber boats, but they would be forced to retreat due to Polish resistance. Even though they were able to mount a defense on the afternoon of September 5th, though, the Polish units were not in a position to hold on to Rosen indefinitely, and they would be given the order to withdraw on the night of the 5th. As the bulk of Army Maudlin retreated south towards Fortress Maudlin on the outskirts of Warsaw, the Germans focused their efforts on moving east, and then there would be a lull in the fighting as the Polish forces entered and prepared the defenses of the fortress, which the Germans would not arrive at until September 10th. The Battle of Mawawa would cost the Germans about 1,700 casualties, although, as always, and which will always be the case, uh, there's a, a bit of a difference between estimates and claims here. On the Polish side, casualties were around 2,700, with a large percentage of those occurring during the retreat from their forward positions as they made their way south and came under German air attack and German artillery fire. One of the primary reasons I placed this battle here in the first episode covering the ground operations is because it is the perfect example of what both armies would be capable of. Given a prepared position, the Polish defenders were very capable of holding their own against German attacks. 
and against the greater numbers of equipment that the Germans were able to bring to bear in, in any given engagement, their prepared positions were enough to offset that. But the German army was able to shift and, and move around the areas of greatest Polish strength, which allowed them to best utilize units like armored or, or mechanized divisions to exploit the fact that Polish troops simply could not cover every village or road with the same amount of defenses. You know, this wasn't the Western Front in World War I. The, there were always areas that could be outflanked or outmaneuvered. This is basically the template of all of the opening battles of the Polish campaign that we will see repeated time and time again. A group of Polish defenders will stop the Germans with a prepared set of defenses, but will then be outflanked by the German advance and forced to retreat. Next episode, we will see this happen multiple times with Army Pomorcia on the southern end of the Polish corridor.